Good morning. <laughs> so good to be here. My name is Lenka Pesh, as uh, already Rick introduced you. I, am, um, I do know Rick from Voice. Uh, it's called Now Morning College. We did do two units together, that we figured out. We did uh, visible literature, and uh, not visible literature, wisdom and writings, yeah, and uh, a parcel care unit together. And uh, yeah, what else can I say? <laughs> I am a mother of four. I've got four children already all grown up. I've got my lovely daughter here, Gloria, uh, who is a really great support as well. I've got an older daughter. Her name is Dahlia. She's got three children married, three children, um, beautiful grandchildren of mine, of course. I've got two sons, a 21-year-old and an 18-year-old. And the most beautiful thing about all of them is they all love the Lord. And I am also a French teacher at Mania Baptist College. I'm teaching French there. I'm doing a bit of guitar tutoring as well. And I am originally, well, I'm still, I am there <laughs> from Varata Baptist Church. I'm a, pa a pastoral care there for the worship teams and also a worship leader too. But I, as even if Rick said, you know, I'm ahead because I have my Masters of Ministry finished, I'm not ahead at all because I'm a beginner in preaching. <laughs> so I'm so really very thankful for you to have that grace to listen to me today. And I just really asked God to take over. I'm very happy today too that it's actually the birthday of the church. We, as you probably know, two, more than 2,000 years ago, there was a pouring out of the Spirit when Jesus went up and he promised that the helper would come and the helper came and that's why we that's why we still grow today god's church isn't that beautiful and so on this birthday i am also asking god to pour out his spirit on all the churches and add on people again now before we start or before i start to speak i would like you to close your eyes Envision yourself into the time when Jesus was walking with the disciples. He talked a lot about all the things that will be happening, that he will be betrayed, that he would have to go and give his life. He also said that a helper will be coming. Lots of other things that Jesus said might have confused you if you're one of the disciples and sitting there in that time, might be excited. You might be also scared. But Jesus is not leaving you alone. And then he comes together with all the disciples, with you being a part of it, sitting in the grass probably or standing and praying. And he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be, become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 
Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. You may open your eyes. Amen. Every time when I read this prayer of Jesus, I have two strong emotions. One of great joy, knowing, you know, that the Son of God is praying for me. It says it in there, or praying for the future disciples as well, future believers. And it's a gratefulness that I can't really grasp. But then it's also mixed with deep grief. Why? Looking at the world today, especially our Western Christian world, I do ask myself, does Jesus ever get his prayer heard? As in, you know, fulfilled. If you think about it, if we pray, we usually expect that the prayer will be heard and that things happen, and usually we want it to happen straight away, or we hope it's going to happen soon. Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago, and is his prayer heard? There are many arguments about several themes among Christians, especially in social media. It is sometimes rather shocking how Christians against Christians attack each other. I don't want to go into any specifics today, but no matter what the reason and arguments are, we must ask ourselves, how does this look to the world? Does it help to testify about the truth? about Jesus. Jesus' pr prayer fascinates me because he is the Son of God, the one who could ask for anything, anything. And yet, if we have listened carefully to this prayer, his greatest wish is that we are one. And it does happen. It happens in lots of places. Today, I feel we are one. We do want to hear God. We want to have the Spirit here. We, we have welcomed the Holy Spirit to come in your songs, which is, by the way, really beautiful leading because the first three songs I, haven't even, I didn't even know. But it always shows a very good worship leader if you actually come in as someone that doesn't know the song and you are able to sing along. That's Spirit-led. And that's the oneness that you can have when you have your heart set in the right place. And yet, if I do look in some other things about the reality sometimes, because I do like to see only the good things, but if we are honest, there are lots of things that are not going quite well, even in the Christian world. And I have like this childish thing, if you want to, you know, feeling like being on a long journey, on a long faith journey, and sitting like in the backseat of the car and keep on yelling at my dad, are we there yet? Are we there yet? When do we arrive? And then I can hear this gentle voice, it might, must be the Holy Spirit saying, no, not yet, sorry, sweetie, but you'll love it when we arrive. So keep going, keep being patient. Of course, it is important to read this prayer in context. D.A. Carson, an expert scholar on John's Gospel, which is this whole uh, scripture, I don't know if it's visible, but it is John, Jesus' prayer is actually from John 17. And the section that I have uh, prayed before with you is from verse 14 to 24, just in case it's not visible. So, Dear Carson, an expert on John's gospel, identifies Jesus' prayer in John 17 as a summary of the entire fourth gospel to this point. Principal themes include Jesus' obedience to his father, obedience, 
That's Jesus. The glorification of his Father through his death and exaltation. The revelation of God in Christ Jesus. The choosing of the disciples out of the world, but their mission to the world. Their unity modeled on the unity of the Father and the Son. And lastly, the prayer for the church and her perfection and unity and love to see the glory of the Son. That's the destination. Everyone is destined to come, hear the word, being obedient, and then partake in the glorification of Jesus as the King of Kings. Isn't that amazing? So let's look at this. And Jesus prays in the beginning of John 17. We just heard its first obedience to his Father and glorification of his Father. So this is the truth we know about Jesus. Truth is being obedient to what the Father says and wills. In John 14, 6, Jesus does say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what does that mean for us? If we are followers of Jesus, we ought to stand up for the truth and live by the truth that Jesus has proclaimed about his Father and himself. Although we do live by grace, there are rules which we ought to live by. But why rules? We may also ask, what is the goal of these rules? Let me give you just a small little illustration. As I mentioned before, I am a primary school teacher. I'm teaching language, I'm teaching French. And it's sometimes quite hard for the children to understand the language because it's very different to English. And it's not only just the words that they need to learn, but it's also the grammar, grammar's rules. So if I try to explain to them why it's important to learn those rules, I explain to them again with a different analogy that they can relate to. Most people here in Australia do relate to sport. Football, I love football too. I used to be a football coach and I love tennis and yeah, lots of other sports too, basketball. But let's get to, let's stay just with footy. That's usually the easiest and most people know that. If you want to play a really good game of football, all the people do know, do need to know the rules. They need to know what is allowed, what isn't allowed. There, is, there are even boundaries. So they have to play within the boundaries. If they go over the boundary, then the other team gets the ball or the goal umpire, the, not the goal umpire, sorry, the line umpire has to throw it in. If they hurt each other, depends in what measure, they either get afterwards to tribunal or in the European soccer, they get the yellow card or even the red card. And everyone accepts that. So only if we obey by rules, it's guaranteed that the, the game is going to become enjoyable, but also safe. It's about safety too. So in this thinking, we do have to accept that there are rules. God has given us his rules. Jesus has talked about the rules again and again. The biggest commandment is to love. But loving has always rules so that someone doesn't get hurt. To the next. In the middle part of this prayer, Jesus is choosing disciples out of the world. The mission to the world and the unity modeled on the unity of the Father and the Son. So again, although there is an election taking place, people getting chosen for Jesus' work, it seems still necessary that there, have to, there has something to happen. The unity is not a given. It's not pre-assumed, because otherwise Jesus wouldn't have to pray for it. And why is unity necessary? 
And how does unity look like? Do all have to be exactly the same? Do all have to own the same things, the same amount? What about if you look at the sport again, the different players? Do they all have the same skills, the same body, body you know, if they're big or tall or smaller? Or like especially in soccer, when I was coaching, I did usually get the fast runners in the very front. They were the goal kickers and the stronger kids in the back. They were the defenders. And then usually the tallest guy would be the goalkeeper. Makes sense. So they had different parts to play. Yet, they were united because they did have one goal. They wanted to win. And that's only possible if you play together. If everyone would do just their own thing, it wouldn't work, would it? And then as well, the other thing that we can have a look at, which we can relate to church too, what about off-field interests? Do they all have to be the same? We would say no. And yet, unity is possible. And what's the aim? In a sport, it's winning games. Or winning the flag, of course, in football. But for Christians, what's the major point there? We have heard we are in this world, but not from this world. So we do have different rules, different priorities, God's priorities. What is God's priority? So that no one perishes, but gets saved. That's how much God loves the world. And that's where we come in, in representing God's character and with it, his rules. That sometimes means self-denial, taking up the cross, which is not always pleasant, but necessary. And sometimes it may involve to become, to be ridiculed, or sometimes it means even suffering. That is sometimes not our fault, not our own fault. But we will talk about the meaning of unity a little bit later on. So then, in John 17, 20 to 24, Jesus prays for the church, us. That's what is still valid for to today. And he does say, I ask not only on behalf of these, so the disciples that were there, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. So again, verses 20 and 21 clearly affirm the significance of this prayer for every believer, today's believer. So how does this oneness or unity look like? Well, it leads us actually back to the meaning of truth. What is truth? Always Guinness, a theologian and philosopher, makes this poignant remark about the treatment of truth. He says, there is a double challenge of truth to all people. It's temptation to either shape the truth to our desires or to seek to shape our desires to the truth. I repeat, there is a double challenge of truth to all people, no matter what. You know, if you're Christian or non-Christian, if you're a believer or non-believer. It's temptation to either shape the truth to our desires or to seek to shape our desires to the truth. Of course, as a Christian, we ought to seek the latter because... We want to serve God. And with that, we have to concentrate on what is true that God says. And we do have the Word of God. We have the Spirit. We can pray with Jesus. So with, with striving after truth, we will come to the truth about ourselves. 
and vid it to the truth of being in need of repentance. This is the meaning of grace. Grace doesn't mean that anything goes. Yes, we will get, we all again and again will get forgiven if we fail, but our aim should be to live as in the truth as God is telling us. So if we are receiving this grace, we freely confess our wrongdoings and repent. Set our mind and hearts willingly to change our lives, willingly to get transformed by the Holy Spirit. As you heard before, today is Pentecost, and it fits really well. In Acts 2, 36 to 38, there is the report about listeners of the gospel. Peter actually stands up, you know, the apostle Peter stands up and is uh, proclaiming what Jesus is all about. Before that, all the believers came together as Jesus told them. He told them, get together, stay in Jerusalem, wait, fast, and pray. There was an order. Great, you know, really good suggestion. And how blessed were those that actually believed and did go and stayed and waited. Because it didn't come straight away. They didn't know when it's going to come. But they stayed, they waited, and what happened? The Holy Spirit did come. They were filled so much that they started to speak in different tongues. And the languages that they spoke were that other people heard what they were saying, and they repented too. And it was added to them over 3,000 people. Imagine that if that would happen today, all of a sudden people coming in. What is happening? And all saying, Jesus is king. But what happened after as well? So to get to that point, when the, Jesus, when the Holy Spirit does convict, as it says as well in that passage in Acts 2, 36 to 38, if you want to look it up later on, it says, one of it, it says, in fact, they did get pierced to the heart and about the need for repentance as they realized that Jesus got crucified for their sake. Because Peter did actually say it, the Jesus that you have crucified, that's us as well. It's always easy to only see others, but it's about ourselves too. And so like the hearers of Peter's word, who got convicted that they needed to do something, as they cried out, what shall we do, brothers and sisters, what shall we do? So they did get into a stress. So we do need to come to the conclusion too, because verse 38 says, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And pointing this out is truth and love. Because the truth is making us free. As it is also confirmed earlier in John 8.32. Truth reveals sin. Jesus highlights the urgent need to remain in his word, to grow as a disciple. And as we confess and repent, we become free. But not only that, Jesus further says in John 14, 15 to 17, if we love him, we also would keep his commandments. So we're going back to the rules. And then we will get the advocate, helper, or the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but we can because we know Jesus, abiding in him, and so will the spirit abide in us. And this mindset will lead us to succeed in unity. Another scholar named Kastenberger, rightly points out that together with love, unity is pre-assumed as a vital foundation for the mission of sharing the gospel. 
he says, it is predicated about the acceptance and transmission of the revelation imparted to the disciples by the Father through the Son. So from, from the previous chapters, if you go back into John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus had implemented that new commandment. He said that you love one another as I have loved you. And by this shall humanity know that you are my disciples if you have love to one another. And we surely all know Paul's beautiful exposition of the meaning of love most accurately in 1 Corinthians 13. This beautiful hymn, if you want to say, about love. Now, do you agree that love is closely weaved into unity and vice versa? Does it really always need that love? Because we do have different u unities, you know. If we go back again to sport, you can be united because you are supporting a club. I've, I'm, for example, um, supporting the West Coast Eagles. That's my club. So what does unite me with that club? Usually it is specific colors, so it's yellow and blue. <laughs> and then obviously you're watching the game. You know, you go and watch the game, you have your favorite players, you cheer them on, you look at the umpires, you have your opinions there. So usually you are united in that. If I go to a game and I have someone sitting next to me that is as well a supporter, do I love him? Don't really know that person. So maybe I can love them with a brotherly love because I am a Christian, but does he love me back? I don't think so. <laughs> but love the game and love to win. So it's a bit of a different kind of love. It's not really a caring love. It's more of uh, being united because you have that one goal. You want to win. You want to be better than the other team. You want to win. Or what about in politics? A very, very um, dangerous theme. Some people believe, oh, as a Christian, you should be going for this party, or as a Christian, you should go for this party. What unites that party? I usually do look at policies, but again, does it bring glory to God? Is it motivated by love for one another? It's a different unity, I think. What about workplace? I do have the privilege to live, uh, to work in a Christian workplace. And I would say there is lots of love. And it is a difference. It is a difference to be in a place where you're united because you have the same God. Because you believe in the same values. Because you want people to know Christ. But in another, if I will be in another workplace, the goal of the company, the un unity of the company is more likely they want to make money, they want to be successful, they want to have a great name. So it's a different focus, different priority. And that's probably the difference. So if we go back again to how unity looks like, and love. In other words, where does Jesus in our lives or involvement in the world get his prayer heard? So if we go back to the prayer in the very beginning. Do our lives glorify him as he is glorified in the Father? Do we care about holiness? Because that's what glorifies the Father. It's different. Holiness means to be set apart, not doing the same, not acting the same as the world does, not engaging in gossip, for example, or slandering other people, especially not a Christian to another Christian, that even more. Or what is the difference between being in the world but not from this world? Carson offers, again, a really great definition of holiness. If someone is set apart for God and God's purposes alone, that person will do only what God wants and hate all that God hates. That is what it means to be holy as God is holy. 
Again, if someone is set apart for God and God's purpose is alone, that person will do only what God wants and hate all that God hates. That is what it means to be holy as God is holy. What does God love? God loves life. He is a God of life. He is a God of reconciliation. He is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of grace. But he is holy. He can't be where sin is, where slander is, where people are dividing themselves because they hate each other, because they are horrible to each other. So it needs to be cleansed again and again through the blood of Jesus, through prayer, through repentance. When I was preparing for this sermon, um, or even when I do assignments, or I used to do assignments, when I was at home and writing things, what happens a lot is that I have to have a rest, I have to do something different, and I usually like to clean, would you believe it? <laughs> so it's always my opportunity to go and clean. And while I was cleaning the bathroom, that was yesterday, I was thinking, yes, that's exactly how sin looks like. You know, I clean the bathroom, and it gets dirty again. It's not avoidable. That's what it means to be in the world. The dirt comes again and again. What we have to do? Have to clean it. In the bathroom case, it's me. I am the one that has to clean it. I made the mess as well, so it's only fair enough. But if it's about ourselves, we do have to go to God, to Jesus to get cleansed by his blood again, to get cleansed through prayer, through repentance. Sometimes we do need to as well confess to other people all the things that we are struggling with, that we are getting dirty, and to be cleansed. But how wonderful it is. I love the uh, clean bathroom. It's beautiful to come in a clean room. And that's how it's for us as well, to be cleansed. So, if Jesus is saying that, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. We do know what the evil one is doing. Keep on tempting us into sin. And of course, other things as well, which we don't, won't have the time to get into today. But there are helpful rules to be followed. And truth and rules are always closely connected to true love. So where is this love most likely visible? Previously, in previous sermons, I'm not sure if it was just last week or when it was, but Pastor Rick talked about marriage. And he did explain to you that it is a covenant with rules of love to be followed. Firstly, for the couple's own benefit, for a flourishing relationship, but also as a testimony of love for others to see, for the world to see. Jesus is not praying just for the sake of it, that maybe there could be some difficulties. There is evil out there that seeks to destroy, and it usually does it in marriage, in families, in churches even. That's what his aim is again and again. But it goes it goes beyond marriage and even Christian fellowship for, you know, it becomes as well there visible in the behavior, conduct towards each other inside the church but also outside the church, in the workplace, neighborhood and so on. So we do have to ask ourselves, can a person from the outside recognize Jesus within us? Because that will be actually manifested in love, how we treat that person or how we treat each other. Does it really have to be as extreme as in Acts? In Acts 2, 43 to 47, it is being um, described as this. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had one 
thing in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. So, does that have to be like that? We just give everything away or do we put it all into one corner and have it like that? It is the Holy Spirit that is doing that. We can't do it by ourselves. We will know when it's time to do that. Sometimes it is that you feel really urged and you can't help it and you just do it. But try to listen to that voice that is telling you what to do. Because the amazing thing is what Jesus already as well um, promised. If we do that, our joy will be full. That's what happens. So let me conclude with the effect of meaning of Jesus' prayer. So truth, unity, love, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Firstly, we are in this world, but not from this world. Reserved for God's kingdom and life. This involves telling the truth about God's word, this includes to proclaim the truth about sin and the urgent necessity of repentance. It might be not always popular and may mean some sacrifice of ourself, denying of oneself. But as we ought to remember, it cost Jesus to be crucified for telling the truth about himself. And we are asked to take up the cross too. Secondly, without love, there is no real unity which testifies about the authenticity of Jesus Christ living among us. Thirdly, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promised to give anyone who asks freely, we are able to do all three. That's good news. So after all, as verse 24 affirms, Jesus prays for us to be with him and see his glory. And verse 26 describes the beauty of this ultimate love and being in Christ and the Father, being incarnate also in us. With this, we must assume to be able to love others the way God the Father and Jesus the Son loves, convicted but also empowered by the Holy Spirit. So first conviction, repentance, receiving of the Holy Spirit, being empowered to love I must admit that the greatest and holiest unity seems to be always in prayer, especially in prayer of thanksgiving, saying thanks for everything that God already did. And you just start saying thanks, even if you are in, maybe in a really bad place, but you're starting to say thanks. Your spirit renews. You get re refilled and renewed. Just look at the Psalms. I encourage you, if you haven't read much the Psalms, read the Psalms. Most of them start and end with thanksgiving. The love of God seems to be present in a powerful way when we pray for each other. For God's kingdom to expand for people's healings and reconciliation with God, people, and land. Yes, land as well. The earth is crying too and wants to be replenished. We are, after all, being called to be stewards. So there is a reconciliation needed for that too. So in Jesus' prayer in John 17, it makes it obvious that we ought to grow in truth unity and love while we pray not only in solitude but in our marriage, in our family, 
in our Christians, fellowship, and church. We are encouraged to ask for the filling of the Spirit repeatedly. Let's pray. Once I pray, and I will also pray um, the Lord's Prayer, so please, as soon as I start, pray with me in unison too. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, and we just praise you for your prayer, that you're praying for us, that you still pray for us after so many years, 2,000 years, and you you must be, we, don't, we can't really imagine how it must be for you to see so much that is still not as it should be. We thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that we are not alone, that there is always room for forgiveness, that you never turn any repentant sinner back. You say, welcome, come home, come home, child. We thank you for your grace. And thank you that you lead us into truth, Holy Spirit. May you work in every heart today. May these ears that have listened take in freely all what you have to say. May we get transformed through your spirit. May we be able to not only be united as a church, but also to be able to love others outside so that it's visible, so people see. Thank you for teaching us to pray. And as you taught us how to pray, let's all pray together in unity. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.